Hello, PathNet, and thank you for allowing us to present our data here today. Our question that we would like to talk about today is, can the excessive use of ethanol-based hand sanitizer provide a reasonable explanation for a positive phosphatidyl ethanol result? Last summer, there was a very interesting webinar sponsored by the Research Triangle Institute where they surveyed a large uh, demographic uh, here in the US, and they were focusing on drinking patterns before and after the uh, pandemic began. They found that 7.74 drinks per day were reported by the general demographic, and that increased to 0.94 per day, an increase of 27%. And of those that did report drinking, uh, the amount of binge drinking increased 26%. So this uh, made us think about, well, are we seeing the same thing in our laboratory with dry PETH results? So we surveyed our results from 2019 and 2020, and we did see an increase in the positivity rates. Uh, keep in mind that at USDTL, our testing population is a high risk population. So these are individuals that are being monitored for substance use disorder, uh, abstinence uh, uh, monitoring during their recovery, um, or contentious family uh, court uh, cases where uh, substance use is, is, is a, a big issue in, in, in most of those cases. Um, and so we did see an increase from 29.6% up to 33 and a third percent. Chi-squared analysis revealed that that was um, a statistically significant increase. So we were thinking, and, and I know that, that everyone on this call today uh, has been receiving a lot of uh, questions or, or even explanations or complaints about, well, I'm using Purell a lot now that there's a pandemic going on, and that's why my PETH uh, was, was positive. And so uh, people are trying to use the Purell excuse more and more uh, as this thing uh, uh, keeps going on here in the U.S. So there was a paper uh, uh, presented at a meeting about two years ago where three volunteers produced positive PETH following uh, the use of waterless hand sanitizer. Uh, that was uh, contrary to our experience. Uh, we performed that experiment in-house before we got going uh, with dry blood, dry blood spots about 10 years ago, and we, we did not observe that. So we went back to repeat this to see what we would see. So we decided to do four volunteers. Um, three were social drinkers and uh, one was an abstainer. Uh, we washed our hands with soap and water used isopropanol disinfecting wipe on a puncture site and collected a baseline DBS. Uh, and then we sterilized our hands with the ethanol based waterless hand sanitizer and then collected a dried blood spot while the skin was still moist. And so a graphic depiction of the study design is here, soap and water, uh, isopropanol followed by the baseline collection, followed by ethanol based hand sanitizer, followed by the test collection. And our results are very similar to what we saw many years ago in that the abstainer, of course, was not detected in either one. Uh, social drinker one uh, was not detected before and right at our limit of quantitation on the after. Our social drinker number two uh, uh, reported that, that, that they were off on vacation the week before and that they had consumed uh, several cocktails during the week. And so their result was about the same before and after at 28 nanograms per mil, and then 26 following, and then social drinker number three, we did not detect it. That's using Purell immediately prior to the collection, which um, I'm pretty sure that everyone's collection instructions tell the collectors and the donors not to use these products immediately prior to the collection uh, of any ethanol type test. Um, so we decided that we needed to do a, a larger study that looked at the use of Purell over time. Um, so we partnered with University of Florida researchers, Scott Teitelbaum and Gary Ricefield, and uh, they have determined, uh, their uh, statistic, statistician determined that we needed uh, 15 volunteers to have a, 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 a statistically significant power. Uh, we asked our volunteers to be abstinent for five days prior to the study, and then for the 12 or 13 days during the study. They were provided Purell Advanced Hand Sanitizer Refreshing Gel, which is a 70% ethanol solution. 
uh, one pump equals 1.75 mils. Uh, they were asked to use the Purell between 24 and 100 times per day and maintain a participant log. We then collected urine each day of the study and collected uh, a beginning, a middle, and an end dried blood spot for PETH analysis. And these are our results. So th this is a schematic of the study design so that you can see it graphically. We have at the study site, we did a pregnancy test for the uh, female participants to make sure that they were not pregnant. We then collected the dried blood spot, collected the urine, sent them home with the Purell uh, pre-measured out for them, and, and they collected uh, five um, uh, urine specimens for ETG, ETS analysis. On day six, they came back in uh, with their urine samples. We collected another urine and blood spot and then for the next five days, they were sent home with collection supplies uh, to collect five urines. And then on the last day, we collected a dried blood spot and a urine sample on the last day. So here are our results. Uh, we have uh, completed 14 out of 15 participants. Um, of those 14 that we've received all of their samples, 13 of them have produced at least one positive uh, urine during the study for either ETG or ETS or both. And this was kind of expected according to the literature that's been generated over the past uh, 15 years or so. Um, however, no participant provided a positive PETH result. So this was this was interesting. We did have one participant uh, that did have a PETH of 13 and we uh, we sent that back through and reanalyzed it and, and it certainly is a PETH at 13. So we decided to take a little deeper dive into this particular donor results and see if there was anything interesting going on with this donor. Um, here we have a chart of the results and we have the days of the study on the X uh, axis and we have the measured concentrations on the Y axis. So for the ETG normalized to a 100 creatinine, we can see that on day 11, there was a huge spike at 1200 nanograms per mil. ETS had three smaller spikes along the way with on day 10 uh, uh, an ETS of uh, uh, approximately 200 nanograms per mil. And then here are the three PETH results. We started out with a five. Uh, we had a not detected uh, at the midpoint, and then we had the 13 at the end. And zooming in on those last couple of days, uh, just so that we can see the ETS here, um, it's sort of clear uh, that this individual probably had some other source of ethanol uh, besides the uh, Purell. Uh, and so uh, as seen with the uh, isolated spike of the ETG, and then the two different uh, many spikes of the ETS with uh, specimens uh, in between uh, being not detected. So uh, uh, more to be learned about this. Uh, the study is ongoing. Um, comparing this back to the uh, participant log may prove some interesting insights. Um, and so we look forward to uh, finishing this study, uh, fully analyzing the data and, and publishing that at a future conference and in a future manuscript. So I thank you for your attention today and I appreciate the opportunity to present here at the first PethNet conference. And I look forward to any questions that we have uh, in the live portion of this uh, conference. Thank you and have a good day.